We interrupt this video for a special shout out to you, the viewers, for making the previous low budget review, LDR 13, Frankie and Johnny, the highest viewed video in the history of low budget reviews. So again, a special shout out to you, the viewers. Now, on with the video. On March 14th, 1974, Ethan Cohen was born in Israel to a Jewish family. He grew up in Sharon, Massachusetts. He attended the Maimonides School, a Jewish day school in Brookline, Massachusetts. Upon graduation, he attended Harvard College, where he wrote for the Harvard Lampoon. He graduated from Harvard in 1995. Cohen first produced scripts in 1995 and 1997 for Beavis and Butthead, where he was credited as Ethan Cohen. He has since written for other Mike Judge related projects including King of the Hill from 2001 to 2005 and the feature film Idiocracy released in 2006. In the late 1990s he worked on two other TV series, the animated Recess and the short-lived It's Like You Know. In 2007 he wrote the short film My Wife is Retarded. He also worked on the animated series American Dad and wrote the episode Failure is not a factory option. In 2008, Cohen co-wrote, along with Ben Stiller and Justin Theroux, the action comedy film Tropic Thunder. He also wrote Madagascar 2, Escape to Africa. Cohen wrote the script for Men in Black 3, released in 2012. In 2015, he made his directorial debut with Get Hard, which he also co-wrote. Does this DVD qualify for a low budget review? Well, I bought this DVD, well actually two DVDs, because it's a three-filled barrel collection, in the middle of the pandemic for $6.99. So it does qualify as this less than $13.99. Explain to my daughter why she has to go to school in the gangbang school district. Why do you want me to get murdered? Murdered. Ah! They're sending you to San Quentin? Help me to not be someone's bitch. I could pay you. He thinks I went to prison. You are not exactly a thug. Bitch, don't walk away from me. What the hell did you just say to me? Wake us up! Get hard. We're gonna go get you some protection on the inside. Who the hell are you? I don't think they've ever seen a white person before. That is not the problem. Wake it up. James King, played by Will Ferrell, is a wealthy hedge fund manager at Barrow Funds and is engaged to Alyssa, played by Alison Brie, who is the daughter of his boss, Martin Barrow, played by Craig T. Nelson. During an engagement party for James and Alyssa, the FBI arrive and arrest James for fraud and embezzlement. James's lawyer urges him to plea bargain to a shorter sentence, but James refuses because A, he has not committed the crimes, and B, he believes he will be exonerated. But he is found guilty and sentenced to 10 years in prison. Not some club fed, but the judge, giving in to public pressure to get tough on white collar criminals, sentences him to 10 years in San Quentin State Prison. This is the first unrealistic element in the movie. You'd think that being tried in the federal court, they would have to find a federal prison to, uh, to uh, imprison them in. But he's not. He's sentenced to 10 years in San Quentin State Prison, and he gives. The judge gives uh, 30 days to, for James to get his affairs in order. Alyssa leaves James after he suggests the two flee the country together. In the meantime, Darnell Lewis, played by Kevin Hart, who manages a small car wash in the parking lot used by James, needs money to afford a house in a better neighborhood, away from the bad neighborhood they live in. He's concerned because he wants to put his daughter, Michaela, in a better school. Shortly after his arrest, James encounters Darnell in front of his car and, assuming he has been in prison because he is black, begs Darnell for help, requesting that he be toughened up. Darnell, however, has never been to prison and has very little experience in fighting. Nevertheless, he agrees to James' offer 
concealing the fact that he has never been in prison on the condition that James pays him $30,000, which he hopes will enable him to buy a house in a better neighborhood. Darnell's training involves pepper spraying James, remodeling his house to resemble a maximum security prison, and creating multiple scenarios where James must defend himself. Needless to say, they all fail miserably. During his training, he gets in touch with Martin Barrow to ask him if Martin has an idea who has committed the crime. But Martin is the actual embezzler and thinks James is onto him. He orders a hitman named Gale, played by Paul Ben Victor, to monitor James. James's training is not going well, and Darnell suggests that as he cannot fight or act tough, he should prepare in other ways for prison and takes him to a gay hookup spot to teach James how to perform oral sex in prison. James can't go through with the gay sex and instead tells Darnell that he will keep going and do whatever it takes in order to get hard. He begins to work out harder and faster, makes shivs, learns how to smuggle contraband in the anus, they refer to as keistering, and seems to be making progress. Uh, Darnell simulates a prison ride with help from James's domestic staff. Uh, unfortunately, James gets a shiv stuck in his head. Darnell brings James home for Rita, played by Ed Edwina Finley, who is a nurse to treat the wound. James has dinner with Darnell's family and listens to the tale of how he ended up in prison, which is actually just a retelling of the movie Boys in the Hood. After James leaves, Darnell tells his daughter that the story wasn't real, but she saw Boys in the Hood, so not, no need to worry about that. Uh, she also says that James wouldn't last in prison or even her school. Uh, seeking protection for James in prison, Darnell arranges for James to join a local gang called the Crenshaw Kings, of which his cousin, Russell, played by uh, Trip T.I. Harris, is the leader. Russell tells him that he should probably join a white gang and refers him to the Alliance of White Gang. James goes, goes to the Alliance of Whites hangout, but they think he is a cop. They attack James, but Darnell rescues him by breaking in with a flamethrower. With only days left before James is to report to prison, he and Darnell deduce that Martin is the real embezzler. James reckons that the records are on Martin's computer, and they sneak into his office disguised as janitors. But Gail finds them and takes them back to the computer and reveals to James that Darnell has never been in prison. Uh, James is upset by this news and breaks off his friendship with Darnell. James returns to the Crenshaw King's hangout, asking to join. They accept him as one of their own and order them to kill someone as part of his initiation. Before James can do this, Darnell arrives in time and convinces James to expose Martin. James and Darnell uh, sneak onto Martin's yacht to retrieve the computer, but they encounter Gale and his men. However, they fight them, and then Martin and Alyssa arrive. Martin confesses the, uh, to the embezzlement, saying that he had no choice after one of his stocks came. Then, they try to convince James to run away with them, but he refuses and runs through a life raft, raft, raft with Darnell. Uh, when Gale shoots the life raft, uh, James pulls out a gun he has concealed in his anus and aims at a gale. That's called the keistering, as I said earlier. Uh, U.S. Marshals appear on boats, summoned by the ankle monitor that James triggered because he's uh, outside the county line, so the ankle monitor is triggered. Martin Barrow's computer provides the evidence needed to clear James, but James still ends up getting six months in prison for holding an unlicensed gun. But thanks to Darnell's training, James is prepared for his sentence, whereas Martin is not, and is attacked by inmates. Uh, James spends his time in prison helping the FBI to retrieve all the assets that Martin stole. They unfreeze his assets, and he guides Darnell's investment so he and Rita are able to open their own car wash. In many ways, the plot of this movie is similar to the plot of Trading Places. In Trading Places, uh, as you may or not, may not remember, two brothers, Randolph and Mortimer Duke, co-owners of a commodities trading firm in Philadelphia, uh, they, who have opposing views of nature versus nurture, conduct an experiment 
switching the lives of two people on opposite sides of the social hierarchy. Their managing director, Ivy League educated Louis Winthorpe III, and poor Black Street hustler Billy Ray Valentine. Thus, they schemed to have Winthorpe framed as a thief, a drug dealer, and a philanderer, and have him fired at, and his bank accounts frozen. In the meantime, Valentine is installed with Winthorpe's former job, learns the business, and uses his street smarts to achieve success. In a key turning point of trading places, Winthorpe, who is informed that he was framed by the Duke brothers, seeks revenge by killing them. Valentine suggests caution, telling him that the best revenge is to make the Duke brothers poor. Thus, they scheme to short Orange Juice Futures contracts, switching the original report with a forgery that predicts low orange crop yields. The Duke brothers, on the other hand, buy Orange Juice Futures, hoping to make money when their report is made public. Uh, after the broadcast of the actual crop report and prediction of an overall harvest, the price of orange juice futures plummets, resulting in financial ruin for the Duke brothers and immense profits for Winthorpe and Valentine. Uh, here, uh, as in Trading Places, uh, there is a plot involving a senior no good Nick, Martin Barrow, who seeks to frame his younger protege, James King, for fraud and embezzlement. At a key turning point in the movie, Darnell Lewis, who is not rich, but apparently is hardworking and has a moral compass exceeding that of most of the other characters in the movie, seeks to dissuade James King from doing something really stupid, i.e. killing someone. Uh, the two ultimately win, resulting in prosperity for both, and ultimately the bad guys, um, Martin and Gat, Gail, uh, lose. The only difference here is that Darnell doesn't really switch places with James King, he only agrees to receive $30,000 to move his family to a better neighborhood. Unlike Trading Places, uh, which was a successful execution of the Pygmalion formula with Eddie Murphy substitute for the Flower Girl, here in Get Hard, th things seem to fall flat. There are a number of racial and sexual stereotypes, which would be excusable if they were funny, but they are not. In this movie, Farrell's character, James King, is a stereotypical rich, smart, white character, and Kevin Hart, who plays Darnell Lewis, is a hard-working, honest black character. Yet James goes to Darnell for help adjusting to prison life simply because he is a black man and assumes he will know about being in prison. That alone is an insult, not to Darnell, but to the audience. From there on, Darnell helps train James train for prison, and this naturally entails every stereotypical prison cliché. All prisoners are either black, Hispanic, or gay. In one scene, we see a white supremacist gang, so on the plus side, the movie, it, this movie is an equal opportunity offender. Um, this movie is rated R for pervasive, crude, and sexual content and language, some graphic nudity, and drug material. And it seems that this material is gratuitous, as if trying to justify an R rating. One scene shows James attempting oral sex, and we actually see a penis. Uh, I, was it fake? I don't know, but it seemed real to me. Uh, also, in several scenes, we see Farrell's buttocks, which quite frankly didn't do it for me. Interestingly enough, all the employees of Barrow Funds are white people uh, without any black employees. All the servants at King's house are Mexican, and all the gang members in the Crenshaw Kings are black. While I disdain wokeness vehemently, this is just offensive. Uh, the worst element of this movie is that it's not at all realistic. Anybody who's in King's predicament probably should try to find out why he was framed, which would have resolved the situation much sooner. But for some reason, only in the second half of the film do James and Darnell start to piece together uh, what has happened. Uh, and Martin's role in the embezzlement isn't really explained except for a few words towards the end of the movie. In conclusion, Get Hard was very satisfying, and I want that one hour and 40 minutes back. Unfortunately, if the box office means anything, we're more likely to get more of this type of movie as it grossed uh, $111.8 million on a budget of only $44 million. Uh, it was a uh, panned by the critics, though. Um, I give this movie a rating, rating of 3 out of 10.
I think I said on the review for the campaign that there wasn't any room for extras with all the room on the DVD being taken up by two feature-length movies, uh, in other words, Get Hard and the campaign. But at least we get English and Spanish subtitles here, so there's that. Both the campaign and Get Hard were poor movies, with Semi-Pro being a mediocre movie, and the DVD extras weren't much to write home about either. Therefore, I would not recommend this three-film collection, even though it was modestly priced at $6.99, so uh, two of the movies you probably shouldn't watch anyway, and, and uh, Semi-Pro, if you're inclined to watch it, you can watch it uh, maybe on uh, Netflix or Amazon Prime, but yeah, I'm not recommending this uh, uh, two-DVD, three-film collection. That's it for this DVD review. Um, I have to brook in, so I, I may I'll probably do that for uh, next week's review. And um, I have uh, falling down coming by the end of uh, today, so I'm well stocked for DVD reviews. Um, like the video and comment it on it, and uh, hit the subscribe button to be informed of the latest low budget review. As always, thanks for watching.